Okay. All right. We are live, Melanie. Hello, hello. Hello again, Abby. How are you? I'm very well. It seems only a few days since we last met. Only a few days. It's been a week. Oh, and the holiday of Hanukkah is starting. We didn't even put any focus on that. The holiday of light. Let's bring some light to the world, Melanie. Will you help me? I'll do my best, as usual. As usual but well. I can. I really just. I can't really shine, given your own radiance. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I appreciate that, but you shine in your own way, and that's and that's why I talk to you every week whenever I'm able to get a chance to. But so much to talk about today. Mm -hmm. You recently wrote a post about Iran, and a recent article on Iran. Yes, please tell us what 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 the focus is now. Yes, well, this was an article that I wrote for the Jewish News Syndicate, um, and it was uh, sparked by uh, President Rouhani of Iran. Uh, calling Israel a cancerous tumor. Now, nothing surprising about Iranian regime apparatchiks calling Israel a cancer, but Rouhani was the great hope of uh, the West. Uh. They believed that Rouhani was a moderate. And one of the reasons given, one of the many reasons given why the Iran nuclear deal brokered by President Obama uh, but with the enthusiastic support of Britain, France and others. One of the reasons given for that deal was that it was said that it would help bring, it would help President Rouhani, who was a moderate, bring Iran in from the cold. It would help him defeat the extremists in his own regime, to which there were two points to be made. One was that the only person who matters in the Iranian regime is the supreme leader, Khamenei. Um, Rouhani is merely a fig leaf. And anyway, Rouhani wasn't really a moderate. This was brushed aside. None of us knew what we were talking about. Of course, Rouhani was a moderate. Um, indeed, I was on British TV at one point with the former Foreign Secretary Jack Straw, the Labour Foreign Secretary, right. who is in the Iran camp for reasons which I can only uh, surmise. And he said, you know, I was quite wrong that Rouhani, he knew Rouhani personally, he was a great guy. Uh, he was a true moderate, and we had to do everything possible to empower him. Here is Rouhani saying that Israel is a cancerous tumour, um, result, uh, which was formed as a result of World War II. And he not only said that, he descended to full-blown Jewish conspiracy theory by saying they, not quite clear whether they is Israel or the Jews, mm -hmm. they deployed a power in the region that completely obeys the West in regional matters. They formed the fake Israeli regime and killed and displaced the historical nation of Palestine. So completely in the tank, complete extremist, Jew hater, all the rest of it. And this was followed by the Supreme Leader himself uh, urging uh, 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 the, this was a, at a conference of the Islamic uh, nations, urging the conference to strengthen the Islamic awakening and resistance movement in the region as much as they can. In other words, war, war, war. So here we have, you know, Iran behaving entirely according to type, uh, threatening, you know, death and destruction, uh, uh, terrible anti-Semitism. And lo and behold, uh, the nations uh, in Europe that supported the Iran nuclear deal um, are still busily supporting it. Not only are they busily supporting it, uh, but they are trying to get round the sanctions that have been reimposed by President Trump. Right. President Trump right. famously uh, disapproves of the Iran deal and has reimposed uh, uh, two sets of sanctions uh, which are designed to cripple the regime, bring it to the negotiating table at the very least uh, to, to, to really give up its nuclear weapons program or bring down the regime. But anyway, uh, President Trump has threatened uh, that uh, any country which uh, tries to get round these sanctions will itself feel uh, his displeasure. No one in Europe believes that, clearly, because they are trying to get round it, quite, quite mm. astonishingly. Not only are they continuing to kind of support the deal and continuing to talk to Iran to keep Iran in the deal, uh, in inverted commas, um, but... Um, uh, about a month after President Trump announced the reimposition of sanctions, the foreign policy chief of the EU, Federica Mogherini, announced a, a ruse to get round the sanctions uh, by which there would be a special EU payments channel established by some company which would use a system of credits to enable compensation to be given for goods traded between Iran and Europe. And this, the whole purpose of this ruse was to allow countries in Europe to continue to trade 
trade with Iran uh, without the need for European banks to transact these payments. In other words, it was a kind of slate of hand. So um, Austria and Luxembourg uh, seem to have expressed some interest in hosting the company that would uh, uh, be delivering this, this ruse, only to be stamped on firmly by America, which basically said, you know, you do this and, you know, you're out. And so they withdrew. And then a few days ago, the Wall Street Journal reported that France and Germany have now stepped up to the plate. They have said they will host the company and the British government is considering joining them. So here you have a situation where Iran continues to be a genocidal, warlike war-mongering regime. It's been at war with the West since it came to power in 1979. Um, it's trying to build nuclear weapons. It threatens genocide against Israel. It's marching steadily into the region and has been enabled to do so because of the relief of sanctions, which have given it the money in order to arm and train and recruit and equip uh, the Hezbollah and the Hamas right. uh, to go into, the, in, in, into Yemen and all the rest of it. And here are France and Germany and possibly Britain trying to get round the sanctions that are designed to bring it to heel. I mean, it's, it should be, in my view, un, in, unconscionable to trade with such a regime at all. Right. But to continue to do so in these circumstances is really quite extraordinary. And uh, what I also said in this piece was that as far as Great Britain is concerned, um, the, the effect of its appeasement of Iran is already very close to home. Leave aside the fact that Iran threatens Britain. Leave aside the fact that British as well as other coalition troops died in Iraq in considerable number as a result of Iranian bombs uh, being placed in Iraq. Leave that to one side. Britain has what is effectively a hostage in, te in a prison in Tehran at the moment. Uh, she is a lady called Nazanin, uh, uh, sorry, Nazanin um, Zagari Ratcliffe. But she's she British? Is, she's a dual Iranian-British national. She's married to a British man. They have a four-year-old child. And uh, she was a uh, she worked for the BBC, but in some fairly mundane capacity, the Iranians chose to say that she uh, was trying to foment uh, insurrection against the re Iranian regime. Uh, by all accounts, not just a trumped-up charge, but a preposterous trumped-up charge. She's been in prison for two and a half years in Tehran on a five-year sentence, uh, separated from her now four-year-old child. Um, there was a brief window of optimism a couple of months ago. She was released for a weekend, and it was the most cruel thing, the most cruel thing, because then she went back to prison. She was released and was reunited with her husband and her child, and then she went back to prison. Wow. Um, and by all accounts, you know, she is in a, in a bad way. Um, now, the British Foreign Secretary has been, of late, being very proactive in trying to get her out. He's been traveling to Tehran. He's been using, you know, every every means of diplomacy available to him. And the Iranians won't move. And it's not surprising because he's negotiating from a position of complete surrender. Right. Right. I mean, the Iranians are hardly going to take him seriously when they know that Britain will lean over backwards, including upsetting uh, and alienating the President of the United States in order to continue trading with Iran. Right. So what sort of leverage does he have? He has none. And he had the, the, the it, was, it was pathetic what he said. He said, you know, Iran has got to stop uh, using uh, Nazanin, Zaghari, Ratcliffe and other dual nationals um, as, 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 as leverage, as leverage. Well, the only reason they have leverage is because Britain has put itself in a position where Iran thinks that by using this British national, they can force Britain to oppose sanctions, uh, the, the, the reimposition of sanctions, even more than they're doing now. So the leverage is entirely the British government's fault. Um, in its ridiculous attitude. And this is, this is what you get when you appease a non-negotiable, when you try to negotiate with a non-negotiable agenda, when you appease an unconscionable agenda, uh, rather than uh, uh, take the only decent and moral position, which is to say, we'll have nothing to do with you, and what's more, we're, we're going to punish you if you continue to behave like this, uh, then the, you know, the, the price of appeasement 
uh, is precisely this, um, that, you know, you put your own uh, citizen at, at in, in, in serious danger um, and you undermine the defence of the West. And that's what Britain and even more so Germany and France are now doing. Wow. So t- two points about Iran, I'd just love to hear your feedback on just recent um, news and analysis. One, I think it was just yesterday that Secretary of State Mom- Mike Pompe- Pompeo of the United States mentioned that Iran just had a test, tested a ballis- ballistic mm. missile that is able to reach Israel and I think Europe. Yeah. And saying totally against, of course. against every deal, why, why, but yet silence everywhere except exactly. from the Secret- Secretary of State of the United States. Exactly. And... Um, it's not just disgusting, but I mean, it actively undermines the United States. I mean, having said that, the United States is, you know, it's much more powerful than European nations. But nevertheless, I mean, you know, Iran is currently, let's put it at its most conservative. Iran is not being persuaded to change its behavior because it still thinks it can use the countries of, of Europe, right. Germany, Britain, and so on, right. to oppose effectively right. uh, Donald Trump. Um, And while they continue to feed that illusion uh, in Iran, Iran's not going to move at all. Right. And the second point is actually an analysis that someone recently wrote. I forgot who wrote this, that this recent uh, conference that you were mentioning, I think where Rouhani spoke Mm -hmm. at this Iranian conference that very much was focused on on Israel and and, and again, the war against Israel. It's the Islamic Unity Conference. It wasn't the Iranian conference. Okay, the Islamic Unity Conference, but Iran was using it as a contra to the growing openness of the Sunni countries with Israel, the developing relations between the, some of the Sunni countries and Israel. So Iran's trying to put the war against Israel on the, in the focus of what should be the Islamic world to try to stunt that growth. That, that, that well, they, they are very concerned about it, obviously. Um, uh, it is, um, uh, and, that, and, and, and hopefully they are, you know, they're going to become more concerned about it. The opposition of the Sunni world to uh, Iran um, has led the Sunni world, as we know, led by Saudi Arabia, uh, to form a tacit and not so tacit alliance with uh, not just America, but with Israel. And we know the difficulties that that's encountered with the recent uh, uh, murder of Khashoggi uh, uh, in, uh, in Turkey. Um, and that's, you know, that's complicated the matter. But nevertheless, that alliance is still strong. Right. And um, the purpose of that alliance is that, you know, is to destroy Iran, or rather to destroy the Iranian regime. Um, yeah, and the Islamic ha- regime of Iran. Yes, right. uh, indeed. And, but, you know, the, the, the people of Iran need themselves to be freed from the regime that oppresses them. Right. Um, so, of course, Iran is going to be, you know, tr- trying to... to, to um, uh, to to agitate the Islamic world in general against this 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 deal, um, I have no idea how successful that will be. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the, the, the Sunni world, you know, <clears throat> while Saudi Arabia <clears throat> uh, dis- has decided, while Saudi Arabia thinks that you know its interests are served by an alliance with America, Israel, and the West, that's going to continue with the Sunni world. Right. All right, putting Iran to the side right now. Paris is literally burning right now, or like the past three Saturdays, they've been in protest. Yesterday was the worst. It keeps on getting worse and worse. Tens of thousands of people. What is going on in Paris, Melanie? I really, I have, I have, I have no clue. Who, who is protesting? Why are they protesting? What's going on with Macron? I'm really at a loss to understand. Even from the news reports I'm reading, uh-huh. I'm not reading details. I'm, the Yellow Jackets. Who, who are the Yellow Jackets? Well, uh, the Yellow Jackets... Um, they're wearing yellow jackets, uh, uh, so that's why they're called, you know, gilets jaunes. Um, but they are just um, French people who are in revolt against President Macron. Um, and um, the uh, the uh, the issue which has inflamed them in particular is fuel tax. And the fuel tax is being imposed, as far as I can understand it, because Macron believes that France has a duty to combat climate change. Um, Now, this is beyond stupid, because uh, this is another argument, but my own view of man-made global warming theory is that it is a scam, and it is being shown to be a scam by evidence the whole time, which you won't read about, because um, the agenda is fixed by 
academics who depend for their grant funding on these spurious forecasts of imminent planetary apocalypse. Put that to one side. Okay. That is the issue which has led Macron to impose a fuel tax. And so the French have done what the French always do. I mean, France is a revolutionary society. In my view, it's hardly changed in that respect since the French Revolution. Right. It, they take to the streets. They take to the streets when they feel that their interests as citizens are threatened. Um, and they start burning the place down. Um, it's a much more violent society than I think virtually any other European country mm. that I can think of in the sense that, you know, the people so regularly take to the streets and start burning the place down right. uh, when they don't like the policy of their government. Now, Macron, I mean, I, I always took a very, very dim view of Macron because Macron always made it clear that he is a, an EU fanatic. He believes in, um, he's, a, he's a globalist basically, um, and he believes, you know, uh, that uh, Europe can only flourish if it is united under one government. Now that makes him, in my view, an anti-French patriot. Mm -hmm. And very interestingly, recently on um, uh, Remembrance Sunday, Remembrance Day, November the 11th. Um, he, Remembrance Day for whom? Uh, for well, this, this is the uh, the anniversary of the. This is the the. This is Remembrance Day in Europe for the uh, for the for those who died world in the world first world, world, first or second Got world it. wars, world war and it was the Europe. the anniversary of um, the end of the first world Got war. It. Um, and he took that opportunity to deliver the most extraordinarily stupid speech. Stupid because it was so ideological, it was ridiculous, saying that nationalism was the opposite of patriotism and nationalism was a form of treachery, a form of treason. And he went on to say, wow. he went on to say, because Donald Trump defined himself as a nationalist, um, he, uh, he, Macron, uh, placed the United States among the enemies of Europe. Um, now, this is like madness. Um, uh, uh, I mean, he's placing Europe above, Europe above the interests of his own country. And he's placing the, he's, he's, he's saying, he was saying that the United States is the enemy uh, of Europe. And as President Trump uh, immediately understood, um, he then reminded the world that if it wasn't for the United States, Europe wouldn't be Europe. You know, the United States stepped in to save right. Europe, to save freedom. So this is completely ridiculous. And Macron... You know, he is strutting around the world. I mean, by his own uh, lights, he has compared himself in the past to both Napoleon and to Jupiter. So I okay. think we can safely say that he sees himself as a kind of cross between Napoleon and Jupiter. This man thinks of himself in that kind of stratospheric way. And yet his country is burning under him. He is completely incompetent. He is... Um, uh, he's become tremendously unpopular, um, uh, not just because of the fuel tax. Unemployment is extremely high. Um, the median income is rather low. Um, he promised to liberate the economy when he took office, but nothing of that has happened. Um, the tax burden is the highest in the developed world, if not well, among wow. the highest, if not the highest. Um, he promised when he came to office to restore the security of the country. Well, internally, the security of the country has just collapsed. Um, I'm reading a piece here which says the number of violent assaults and rapes has been steadily on the rise. No go zones, that is Muslim areas, uh, are, uh, are widespread and completely out of control. Um, uh, in May, Macron himself warned that in many suburbs, France had, quote, lost the fight against drug trafficking. And when the Minister of the Interior resigned in October, Gérard Colomb, he spoke of a very degraded situation. And he said that in many areas, quote, the law of the strongest drug traffickers and radical Islamists has taken the place of the Republic. The Minister of Interior said this? The past many... Wow. Yes. 
That's right, when he resigned. Wow. And so, you know, so and meanwhile, so, so you have a president who is showing complete contempt for his own population, complete contempt for the interests of his country, stating explicitly that the interests of anyone's country must take second, play second fiddle to the interests of the world in general. Um, and... Uh, uh, he, he has been offending people the whole time. I'm reading again this piece which says, in 2014, when Macron was Minister of the Economy before he became President, he said that women employees of a bankrupt country were illiterates. In June 2017, just after becoming President, he distinguished between those who succeed and those who are nothing. In other words, those who don't succeed are nothing. Wow. I mean, this is contempt for his fellow human beings. Um, and so on and so on and so on. So while he's strutting around being Jupiter and Napoleon rolled into one, his country is disintegrating under him. And he's merely, meanwhile, he's lecturing the rest of us on what, we, on, on what we should do. And I know you mentioned this before. You believe Macron has taken a, st he, he, he's taken a stance of saying nationalism is the opposite of patriotism. I know you have what to say about this. Right yes. or wrong, well, and what, what, what's going on here? Well, there is, I mean, I've written, I've written about this a lot now because I think it's one of the most important underlying issues of our time that so much of the terrible divisions that are causing such bitterness among all of us uh, in Britain, in America, in uh, Europe, so much of it boils down to this question of nationalism, this question of national identity and the Western nation state. OK, these things all take completely different forms, different contexts, different countries. Mm -hmm. But that's basically what it's about. You know, President Trump says, you know, uh, make America great again. I'm going to put America first. Everybody goes, he's a Nazi because people make that immediate jump, uh, jump between the nation, nationalism, Nazism. And I think I've said before that, in my view, that's completely wrong, that all that nationalism is, is the desire to um, to belong to something called a nation, which is a very large group of people, uh, which uh, believes itself to be bound to its to itself, uh, in, which, in which people are bound to each other by the sense of a common project founded in a common culture, history, language, religion, and so on and so forth, and crucially in a country and a piece of land within which they can elect uh, a government or they can have a government which reflects their culture. That's what a nation is. And if you have a nation in the West which we've had in which our common values are things like uh, individual liberty, respect for human life, uh, equality of women and all those core values, then you cannot defend that unless you believe yourself to be a nation. In 1940, if Britain hadn't had a very strong sense of itself being a nation, it would never have fought Hitler. It right. would never be able to stand up to it. Right. So this idea that the nation is bad and nationalism is bad is wrong. What's bad is imperialism. It's the desire to use your nation as a springboard to take over someone else's nation. That's what's bad. It's imperialism that's bad. Now, in Europe, because the European Union... And that's Project. what Nazism really was. Exactly. That's what Nazism was. It was imperialism. imperialism. Hitler believed himself to be a kind of reincarnation of the Holy Roman Emperor. Uh, that's what he was trying to reproduce, the Holy Roman Empire. And his idea of, of Germany as a nation, which did have a kind of mystical significance, but he... Uh, he, 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 and, and, he and racist faced. He, 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 that's precisely it. His idea of the German nation was a racial nation. It was right. based on some rubbish idea of racial um, Superior. um, uh, superiority and purity. Right. And on the basis of that, he was an imperialist. Right. So this idea, you know, that British nationalism or American nationalism or French nationalism is the same, is just ridiculous. However, that belief has taken hold. And as a result, the, e and the EU project enshrines that belief that the Western nations should not have the ability to act as a nation. Instead, it should cooperate, not cooperate, it should be part of um, a bigger, a transnational entity uh, which takes decisions for it. And as a result, you can't have policeable borders. You can't have national borders because you must have a free flow of people because you're basically all one brotherhood of man. And that has driven millions of people in, uh, uh, the, on the, on, in continental Europe to support 
uh, political groupings which are nationalist. Now, some of those political groupings do have very troubling backgrounds. They are rooted in in neo-Nazi, uh, fascist or racist uh, ideologies. But a lot of them are not. They are simply nationalists. Right. They simply want to have their nations back. And um, but nevertheless, they've all been damned as being as being you know completely beyond the pale. And the country that is most damned is Hungary. Right, I was going to bring that so up. So Viktor Orban of Hungary um, has been uh, uh, he is a muscular nationalist, um, and he's been completely damned as being a you know fascist, a, 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 an ultra nationalist, and an anti semite. Um, and this, as far as I can see, is quite wrong. Um, Hungary is a very troubling country. It has a very troubling past as far as Jews are concerned. Right. It had a terrible history uh, in, uh, in the Holocaust. And it does still have, unfortunately, a lot of people in Hungary who are true anti-Semites and true fascists. And they have a party. It's called Jobbik. And Viktor Orban's party, Viktor Orban is the, is the, is the, uh, uh, the leader of Hungary, and, and, and part of his whole, whole, whole policy is to keep Jobbik out. Right. He is absolutely 100% pro-Israel. He has made it his business to make Hungary safe for Jews in Hungary right. by keeping the, uh, the fascist, uh, anti-Semitic um, element as down as far as he can. And he's kept Muslims out. Now, as a result, he's deemed to be, you know, completely illiberal, authoritarian and Islamophobic. Now, he probably is authoritarian. I mean, by any definition, you know, that is an authoritarian way of behaving. I think he himself has said that he is presiding over what he calls an illiberal democracy. Interesting. But one of the reasons why it's illiberal is because he needs to keep out all those people who really would turn Hungary back into a kind of fascist anti-Semitic hellhole. And consequently, it's a much more complicated and nuanced picture than we are led to believe. I had a fascinating conversation this week. In this room, I interviewed two activists slash journalists from Hungary, and they themselves were saying they were active against jo Jobbik. Jobbik, right? And they were scared. They told me straight out, right in this room on camera, that if Jobbik would have grown and been part of the government, all Jews would have had to leave uh, Hungary. And they themselves, they were Christian Zionists. They would have had to le run away from Hungary. That's how scary it is. And they admitted, yes, there is anti-Semitism in Hungary, but Viktor Orban's government is the most pro-Israel, pro-Jewish. They specifically said pro-Jewish. Well government Hungary has ever had. Yeah. Uh, and it's because they didn't understand why are people upset at us? We just want to look after our national identity and ensure we have a safe oh, country. Well, well, no, but you see, uh, but, you know, by keeping Muslims out, um, uh, he's Islamophobic. The fact is that, you know, as a result, I'm afraid to say, um, you know, if you compare, say, the Jews of Hungary and the Jews of France, who is safer? Right. I mean, there's no, there's no comparison. Um, and, um, it's funny you say that because last week at this at this media summit in Jerusalem, there was someone who actually said, "You can a, 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 an Orthodox religious Jew can walk around the streets of Hungary with his with his head covering that shows he's Jewish, but in France you can't." Well, exactly, and um, uh, this is not to minimise the problems in Hungary. Agreed. And you know, I'm sure one could say Orban is taking measures which are illiberal and authoritarian, and you know, one can say one well, that's not very good. But nevertheless, when you consider what he's trying to stop, it's much worse. Right. And as an interesting coda to that, um, there's a great, without going into great detail, there's a great fight that's been going on for some time in Britain uh, between the ultra-orthodox and the British liberal state. Uh, the British liberal state, through the conservative government, has decided that the problem of Islamic extremism is caused not by Islam, but by separatism, by a community keeping itself separate. Now, perhaps you can immediately see That's where crazy. this one is going. That's crazy. But because separatism yeah. is the problem, so the Haredim, uh, who have a particular way There's of the, life, the ultra orthodox, the ultra -Orthodox right, Jews, Britain, right? um, are under the under the cosh. Why? They are being told by the education inspectors, uh, in respect of their school, some of which have some of which have um, state funding. So it brings them within the ambit of the education uh, inspectors because they have to conform to the basic parameters of of British educational policy. 
And one of those parameters is that they have to teach gay rights. And the Haredim, the ultra-Orthodox schools, say, well, we, we, we're not prepared to do that. Um, uh, we're not prepared to teach sexuality at all because we think that teaching sexuality at all to children is completely wrong. It's to do, with, you know, that's that's the province of the family to, to to look after that, and we regard it as a form of child abuse to teach sexuality. Forget gay rights. We just don't teach sexuality. To which right. the education inspectors have said, well, in that case, uh, your children can't take their part in Brit play their part in British society as equal citizens, and we can't have that. And to which the ultra-Orthodox have said, broadly speaking, um, if you are telling us as British Jews that we cannot educate our children in our schools according to our religious values, that we don't have religious freedom in Britain to do that, we can no longer live in Britain. Wow. So that argument is going on. Wow. But because they've said that, People have said to at least one of these um, ultra-Orthodox leaders, if you can't live in Britain as, a British, as British Jews, where would you go? To which he said, Hungary. Wow. At which point the British Jewish community goes, what did he say? Wow. Because the, the British Jewish community looks at Hungary looks as, at Hungary uh, as anti-Semitic, anti nationalist, Etc. Wow, you you see the clash of values. So uh, the clash of understanding of values. Well, it's very, it's a, it's a tragic situation. Um, it's not even a clash. It's not even a division. I just find all the time, and people on all sides find this. I think um, that there is no, there seems to be no space anymore for reasoned argument. You, you know, on so many of these issues, you can't have a, well, I think this and I accept that you think that and I think that you're wrong for these reasons. You can't have that kind of argument. It's, it descends almost immediately into this kind of screaming abuse. Right. Um, people are deaf to evidence. Uh, and I've written in the past, I wrote in, I wrote in my book, The World Turned Upside Down, which was published in, I think, 2012, that we're living through a repudiation of reason. You know, this is a society which fetishizes reason. Um, and yet, we've abolished the idea of reason. We've abolished the idea of truth. Right. No such thing as objective truth. Right. Without which you can't really have reason. And consequently, it's not really surprising that the ostensible temples of reason, the universities, which produce the ability to think and discuss and where all ideas have to be aired, have become places where free speech and the free play of ideas is being shut down. I mean, I talked earlier about global warming, my may global warming. You um, can't have a conversation, you can't have a conversation about, that. about that. And indeed, if you're an academic, you can't, you can't work if you say what I've just said. You mm -hmm. don't get any money to work. You're, ru you're literally run out of town. You're run out of the campus. Um, and this is a terrible thing. And that's what we're living through. We're living through an extinction of reason. Right. And, and just and, uh, on that note, I have I have a, a, a friend who is a professor of indigenous rights on on some college campus in Britain or no in America in America on indigenous rights of, in, I think in America, and um, but she is a very staunch supporter of the research, right? And she actually developed the research. To, to allow an indigenous pro people to prove that they are indigenous. And through her, her, her system, it comes out very clearly that the Jews are the indigenous of course, yes, peoples yes. of the land of Israel. Well, of course. And obviously because of that position, of her academic position, uh. based on her research, based on her theory that's used by the academic community for all indigenous peoples, but because she is vocal about it, how it proves the Jews as the indigenous people, she is blackballed. Really? In different, wow. in different ways. And it's uh, so it, it follows that same that instead of the marketplace of ideas, you have the squashing of ideas on yeah, on yeah, universities. Yeah, but it's always strikes me as remarkable that notwithstanding all of this, and you know, it's not just the universities, but their echo chamber in the media, which means that on issue after issue, global warming is one, Israel is another. It's almost impossible to find evidence-based analysis in the public sphere. Right. 
And yet, and yet, if you access, talk to, listen to um, people, ordinary people, um, they get it. They kind of, they kind of intuit by osmosis almost right. um, that what they're being told is a pack of lies. And I always think back to the Soviet Union. And the Soviet Union was, you know, the quintessential society where um, uh, uh, free, I free expression of ideas was, was literally stamped on. Uh, people were imprisoned for dissident, be, 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 being dissident. Um, and, you know, you couldn't find what was going on. And yet people at some level, they understood, they understood they were being lied to. And in many respects, they understood what the actual situation was. Now, part of that was it was like smuggled out, literally smuggled out on laboratory paper and other stuff from prison. Yeah. But smuggled out in, a, in another kind of way that people kind of, I think, probably, they kind of learned to decode what was being said. And I feel this the whole time now. I feel that, you know, we're increasingly speaking in code and that out there, ordinary people who are not sort of infected by this kind of groupthink are decoding. They don't know that they're doing that, but they are decoding because they are, they are looking at, they're listening to what they're being told. And then they're looking at situation on the ground as far as they can see it. And they're also applying logic and common sense to the arguments that are coming at them. And logically, they, many of them just don't make sense at all. And then they just don't square with the reality. So you're saying you, you, you feel the, uh, positive because there are some people who are reading through the, the, the brainwashing of, that the mass media is trying to give across. You know me, Abby. I'm a little rare sunshine. <laughs> I'm no, just the I'm sunny just... optimist uh, on the other uh, side of the table. It's just, well, I actually have a ray of light. I actually have a ray of light to bring up to end with. To end with. But before that last point... On, on, on the point we were just talking about right now, just this week we put out an article, a video, Ami Horowitz. You familiar with Ami Horowitz? Brilliant, brilliant videos. He comes out and, and is brilliant. He's able to show the, the truth and hypocrisy of situations. He's the one who made a video on, on, yeah. on a college campus yeah. in, Los, in, in Los Angeles, I think, or somewhere in, yeah. in America. He lifted the ISIS flag. No one gave yeah. him any trouble. Good for that. you. And then he lifts the Israeli flag and everyone uh, hatred mm. at him because he lifts the Israeli flag. Right? So he just made a new video last week. He joined the migrant caravan in Mexico. Oh, yes. And he was standing there interviewing the migrants. Why are you going to America? Right? Because here everyone's saying they need asylum. They need asylum. And every single person said, we want a better life. We want a job. That's not what asylum is for. Anyway, so that's what he's... Th and then he's documenting all of the international aid workers that are assisting this migrant caravan. You're, you're talking about a whole operation with millions of dollars. But anyway, so he's saying this is the migrant This mm -hmm. is the migrant caravan, just putting the facts out there. So we posted this and sent it out. And I sent this out in an article contrasting... The tweet by the new congresswoman of New York City, uh, Alexandria Tartesia Cortez, who compared these migrants yeah. from Mexico to Jews who escaped, were trying to escape the Nazis. Yeah. And I was, and the article basically was, this is a truth about the migrants. How absurd that she's using this to compare them to, to, wow. um, uh, to, to the Jews yeah. who, who escaped the Nazis. And to which, a subscriber responded saying, how dare you defend Donald Trump? <laughs> what can one say? What, 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 what does this have to do with Donald Trump? I mean, yes, he's behind the, the, behind the wall and, and making the issue of the migrants. But we're just trying to focus on the absurdity of this congresswoman's tweet. And no, that's meaning regard, regardless of your position of Donald Trump, regardless of your position of him abusing this issue, regardless of your position of the wall, can you at least pay attention to, to and call out this congresswoman? And, well, there's a like, bunch there's no of, room for that. There's a bunch of people for whom, you know, their minds are completely closed and I'm afraid will never open because, I, you know, you need a psychiatrist really to to really tease this open but it's to do with their personality and and mm. and and what, how they how they feel about themselves being good a good person it's also to be being you know feeling yourself to be a good person and it's got warped um so those people you know you can never you can never 
uh, convince. However, although they're very noisy and although they do actually control the culture, the universities, the media, they are a minority. They are a minority. And that's why the West is so convulsed, because you've got millions of ordinary, sensible, rational, decent people in Britain, America and Europe who are all saying, we've had it up to here with all this rubbish. We want something else. Mm. And the fight is now on right. between the two sides. I mean, right. that's how I see it. So it's, right. it's not, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, I, I don't know how this is going to end. As I've said before, it may end in disaster for, you know, people who do support decency and reason. Right. It may be that, you know, the West is going off the edge of that cultural cliff. But there's, at least there's now a fight right. that's going on. Right. And in that fight, as I said, people seem to have, to a, a greater or lesser extent, an ability to decode what's going on and to understand that they are being told lies and to understand what the truth is. Some, some, some subjects, some topics are more successful in this than others. And I would say the issue of Israel is one of the least successful, one of the less successful, uh, because um, it's too arcane. Not many people will have any reason to have any knowledge of the Middle East, its history, or and most people, because there are so few Jews in the world, most people have never met a Jew and don't even think about Judaism. So they, right. they, they, they start from a position of not knowing anything. And therefore, it's much more difficult for them to actually access the truth about Israel, Middle East, Jewish people, and so on. Right. Whereas other stuff, they can actually see what's going on in their own lives or right. in their own countries. Right. And then they can put it together or put, put it against what they're being told is going on. And they can right. say... It's not true. Right. So um, this is, you know, th that's why I think Israel has a particular problem. Good point. All right. Well, I said we're going to end on a we're going to end on a on a ray of shun, on a ray of light, right? We started talking about how the, the the Jewish holiday of Hanukkah is about to begin, the holiday of lights. We'll get into that another time. Ray of light to end this to the interview today. Last week we had the CNN commentator uh, Lamont Hill who basically at the United Nations Indeed. expressed his full support for the destruction of Israel, even though he tried to backtrack, but he said from the river to the sea, Palestine should be free. That basically means Israel's destruction. And CNN fired him. Yep, I saw that. I saw that. Uh, wonders will never cease. Um, the world turned backwards on its axis briefly when CNN fired him. But who knows? Who knows? Maybe, um, you know, sanity is beginning to break through. Maybe. There we got a ray of sunshine from Melanie today, yeah, folks. Me. Always so optimistic. Ray of I am. Always so optimistic. All right. Well, <laughs> Melanie, always a pleasure. Please, everyone, everyone, please visit MelaniePhillips.com. Sign up for Melanie's newsletter. Get her insight as she writes it. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Abby, as ever. And thank you to everybody for watching and listening. Take care, everyone. Thanks for watching.